We'll start off by talking a bit about college sports, college football, and, of course, LSU as well. Joining us to talk about that, former captain of the LSU Tigers, part of the national championship team, of course, a former Evangel Eagle star, and then played in the NFL for five years and, and does a great job with his own show, Hanging with Hester in the Baton Rouge market, which we encourage everybody to check out when possible. And you can also watch it on Cox on a regular basis as well. He is, of course, number 18, Jacob Hester. Hey, Jacob, listen, happy Memorial Day weekend and appreciate the time. How are you? Yeah, absolutely. Any, anytime you need me, and uh, glad to be on. Well, listen, these are strange times, of course, and we're starting to get some light at the end of the tunnel. Today we get the ruling the SEC will allow people to start at least working out with strength coaches and such on campus. That's the first step, and that will be the case for LSU. As a former player, how important was it to have that structure as compared to trying to stay in shape, so to speak, on your own? Yeah, so I think it's very important for college athletes to be able to come back on campus. It's not like pro football. In in pro football, if you're going through something like this, that you at least live in the same city for the most part, or you can find a way to get to the city that you play in pretty easily. And with college kids, you've got guys spread out really across the country. And a place like LSU is going to have guys from everywhere, right, from California to Texas and Georgia and just really spread out throughout the country and so you want to know what they're doing you want to see if you can get your eyeballs on them and even farther down the road than that if you're players like you want to have that chemistry together if you're Miles Brennan you want to have your receivers there so you can throw with those guys so you can have you know one-on-one passing uh, sessions there at LSU and even if coaches aren't involved which in the summertime they can't be it's important for those guys to be able to be in the same place, working towards the common goal. And so for college athletes, I think they really need to get that. They need to have that time together where they can all make sure that they're doing the right things the right way. And so I I think it's a big deal that they do have the June 8th date because now these coaches also can kind of check in on them. Because when you talk to some of these college coaches across the SEC, you know, the the biggest thing for them is, man, I, I don't know where my guys are at really. I don't really know what they're doing. And you're really you're, – you're a father figure. You're someone who's in charge of all these young men. So I know that's been nerve-wracking for everybody involved. So June 8th is a date that keep, kind of keeps them on schedule as well because that's typically when you would come back to school after finals. You get a couple weeks off. And so as far as timeline, that's about right. Before we talk about LSU football, with regard to basketball, we've seen the – Recent tweet by Dick Vitale saying, look out, LSU's next with regard to what's happening in the college basketball world, investigation, allegations, everything. We've seen what's happened with Kansas. We've seen what's happened with Louisville. Of course, now you got a former agent of Zion Williamson making some claims uh, and even implicating Duke to a degree. Uh, What's the chatter about that regarding LSU, and is that something that is expected, or is it something that we're just going to have to wait and see? Well, it's been something we've heard for a while now. It's not really anything new. And and Dick Vitale, you know, look, I I respect what he's been able to do for college basketball, not only as a coach, but as an analyst as well. But, you know, Dick does kind of pick and choose the teams that he likes to call out on Twitter. And LSU has definitely been the one that's always kind of been in his focuses for the longest time, it seems like. And so, look, Scott Woodward, when he came into this job, it was one of the first things that he wanted to find out exactly what was going on. Uh, we've seen the scheme on HBO get built up and ended up not really being anything that we didn't know. I, I know seeing Will Wade and, and hearing him uh, you know, on different radio interviews, he's looking forward to the basketball team that he's about to have on campus. And college basketball, Ken, as you know, it's a messy world. Um, it, it's not one. It, it's a whole lot of, of messy things. And so – the Zion news came out, and you really don't hear Duke ever in that conversation, and so that's going to raise some ears. But right now, it's just been a lot of hearsay. It's been a lot of, hey, this is coming, and then when it comes, it's not really anything new. And so if I'm LSU and I'm Will Wade, I just continue to move forward until somebody tells me something different. I find it very interesting to see the way everything is developed because we all saw what happened with North Carolina a few years ago with – the clear academic broad issues that took place there and and what happened virtually nothing (laughs) happened to a blue blood program and then of course 
Most recently, we've seen Louisville and what's happening there. They're certainly regarded as a blue blood program. And now Kansas and what's happening there. And they are certainly regarded as a blue blood program. I would agree with you in terms of the national media and their perception of programs and, and how they look at people differently or treat them differently. But we are seeing the implication and the accusations against some of the so-called blue blood programs in college basketball. Yeah, and look, you, you said it, Louisville and, you know, Kansas and, and some of the other programs, you know, you hear the rumors and you hear the whispers, but at the end of the day, there's not really been any action. And North Carolina, I think, is the biggest one to point at. We all know the academic scandal that took place a couple of years ago, and these blue bloods, if they do get something, is typically a slap on the wrist. I mean, I would put Arizona as a blue blood with all – the players that they've had in the first round picks and success they've had on the court and kind of the same thing. It's just a lot of hearsay. And so in college basketball, that's, that's typical, but it does seem like it's been height, you know, at a high point over the last, let's say 18 months. And so something still has not really come out. And until I guess one of these programs gets more than a slap on the wrist, it's really just going to be something that we kind of hear and we throw to the side because it's just been the conversation for 18 months with no real action. Jacob Hester visiting with us, talking about LSU athletics. Turning back to football, I guess the most interesting dynamic of this offseason for me has been the constant attention being placed upon Clemson, being placed upon Alabama, being placed upon Ohio State, even Georgia to a degree. And I would imagine that this will be fodder for Ed Ogeron and his staff it's not that LSU is being disrespected. Look, they lost 14 guys who ended up in the draft, other guys signing with NFL teams. No one expects them to be exactly what they were last year, and yet they have a lot of talent coming back. They're not ready to just voluntarily cede their title. I think LSU is unquestionably a top-10 team. And i got to expect that they're going to use this as some sort of motivation because I think on a daily basis – all we hear about is Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, and maybe Georgia. Yeah, I don't think there's any question. I mean, I, I would use that as motivation as well. And we heard about Clemson kind of the same way last offseason. Of course, they get to the title game where LSU beats them there in New Orleans. And, and then you look at a team like Georgia. And Georgia has done a great job recruiting, but it's not just about recruiting. It's about recruiting and developing. And I think that's what Coach O does better than anybody in the country. Just look at the first round picks they just had outside of Caleb on Chase on. Every one of those guys was a guy that didn't come in, you know, as heralded as most guys that come into a program. You look at Clyde Edwards Eli. Well, everybody wanted Cam Akers. And then LSU gets Clyde and look, Clyde goes first round, the only running back. We all know Joe Burrow's story. Justin Jefferson, a two star guy. Patrick Queen, a guy who played running back in high school, switches over to linebacker. And so LSU develops players as good as anyone in the country. In my opinion, so that's what they're going to have to do. And when you look at their defense, and, and we were going over on the uh, radio on Wednesday, it, it's a very, very good group. I mean, you've got a lot of people who've been waiting their turn and have got some playing time but are really set to become stars. And then offensively, you've got, in my opinion, one of the best duos in the country in Jamar Chase and Terrace Marshall. And so, it, you know, Miles Brennan's going to be one of the big question marks. And Miles is the guy entering his fourth season. And so Miles has been there a long time. I love the fact that he didn't take his ball and go home when he didn't become the starter. And so is there question marks? Yes. But a place like LSU can, you know this as well as anybody, you just got to continue to move forward. You're going to lose guys every single year. That's just going to be the case. When you play at a high level like LSU does, you can't use that as an excuse. You can't use our schedule. You're in the SEC. Schedule is going to be tough every single year. And I know for us in 07, we lost – four first-round picks from the 06 team. And even though we were highly rated, just like this team's going to be, everybody said you can't win at all because of everything you just lost. And so this team's going to hear that, right? We lost the first-round quarterback as well, number one overall pick in Jamarcus Russell, just like this team did. And so this team just has to be themselves. They have to be who they are. And I truly believe that's in their DNA. That's kind of how they're built. And so no excuses. Just got to go out there, continue to develop, and – just be the 2020 team, not the 2019 team, because the 2020 team can still be themselves and go win a championship. And so I'm sure that's going to be their main focus. Couldn't agree more. I think it's a team good enough. I think their offensive line's good enough. Their receivers are exceptional. Their running backs are good. Their defensive line is good. 
Their secondary lost two very high draft picks, and they're still going to be outstanding. Yeah. And linebacker was a bit of a question last year, and look what happened. You had guys, you know, one guy in Queen that became a first-round pick, uh, Phillips, who played well, and even with a guy like Divinity being suspended, uh, there's talent on hand, and you're right, development is a big part of that. And for some period of time, we did not see that. In fact, it was somewhat the opposite way. We saw guys that were very highly rated that either flamed out or never quite became what you thought they would be, and that's not an indictment of Les Miles at all. He did a great job. You played for him, and he had a good staff. But but that was part of the calling card that LSU was for a period of time there. One of the things I think Coach O has done a fantastic job of is he doesn't just recruit guys because he's supposed to. And a lot of coaches, I'm not talking about just prior LSU coaches, I'm talking about everybody. You know, they think, oh, we got to recruit this guy. we got a, a four-star quarterback who's the number 11 dual threat quarterback in the country. He's from our state. We've got to recruit him. No, you don't. If it doesn't fit your system, you don't have to recruit the kid. And I think Coach O has done a fantastic job of finding out who fits his program the best, not who fits just what you think it's supposed to be. And, you know, if, we don't, if we're not looking for, um, you know, a scat back, we need more of a power back, well, that's what we do. And if we're looking for a possession receiver and, and not a 6'6 receiver, it, even though the other guy's not rated as high, well, that's what we go and get. And I think he's done such a good job of roster management and not just recruiting to recruit. And do you want to win the state of Louisiana? Absolutely. You want to put a fence around it? I know all the cliches, but that doesn't mean you put a fence around your state and just get the guys just because. No, you put a fence around the state and get the six, seven, eight guys that you want from Louisiana, and then you say, we're LSU, we're a national brand. We'll go get guys from wherever we have to. And you just don't take guys just to take them. And I think Coach O and their staff has done a fantastic job of identifying who fits the program. And even if, you know, look at the commit they just got from St. James, right? This is a guy that they circled for a long time. And he's, you know, depending on who you look at, he's about the 10th, 11th rated player in the state. But in their eyes, he was much higher than that. And so they go out and they get him and they made him a priority. And so I love the recruiting style. I think it's something that had to be done, and it's definitely been working for him so far. No question about it. And the young man you're talking about, I've seen him play on several occasions, Savion Jones, and he's a real deal. He's an outstanding player. And, again, you're right about rankings. Everybody banks everything on the star system, and that's how they determine who has the best recruiting classes. And you can put some stock in that, but you can't put that as gospel for certain based upon results. You were – a perfect example of that. Now, uh, the truth be told, I did a few of your games when you were at Evangel, okay? So when you decided you were going to come down here in 2001 and pummel Rummel, I did that game. And, and then in 2002 when Rummel went up there to play, you know, at, at Rodney Duran and you took them apart. And I, I joke with Craig Stelts about that all the time. I did that game too. So right. saw you play quite a bit. Those were some unbelievable teams, both of those years, 01 and 02, when you beat West Monroe. Uh, the 99 Evangel team was great, too. You know, Josh Booty's first team that won it was a great yeah. team. Those those were terrific teams you played on. It's hard for me to say which Evangel team was the best team, but you played on two of them. Do you think either one of those was the best Evangel team? Uh, man, I, I know 01 was, was really good, and I know 99 won the national championship, and I was a young, very young player on that team and, and you know, looked up to all those guys. But for me, it's 2002 Evangel. I, I thought we were so good. We had John David Booty, at quarterback, who can make every throw on the field. Tristan Ross was a number one receiver. He ends up going to Oklahoma. Um, it's really the first year we used a running back, and I, and I kind of slid into that role and was fortunate enough to get state MVP that year against some really good offensive guys. And uh, we beat West Monroe twice handily that year. We went to West Monroe. It's funny, Coach Insminger was actually on staff at West Monroe that year, and he, we kind of joked back and forth with each other. And then we beat them in the Superdome, and the score was actually, I think, 35-4. to four. And the only four points they scored was our deep snapper snapped it over the punter's head twice, and that's how they got their points. And so to dominate a team like West Monroe twice, in that year, and of course, you know, we, we played uh, Burns, South Carolina. We really had a national schedule, Longview, Texas, all these teams like Evangel did back then. And um, for me, that year's tough to beat. We had a lot of D1 guys 
I think we added it up, and it was between the junior and senior class. It was somewhere around 15 guys assigned Division One scholarships, and uh, there were some great teams. But that O2 team, I think, had a little something special. Well, they really were, and I covered both of those West Monroe State Championship games, so remember those vividly. And the first one was a great game. The second one, you dismantled them as you talked about, and and I remember their four points very well. Those were special teams. Dennis Dunn, of course, uh, helped build that program with Denny Duran, helping get get things to where it was. And Denny is still there, and he's still a good friend of mine. But uh, those were some unbelievable days to to watch the way that unfolded at Evangel, uh, pretty much starting from scratch and becoming the program it became. Yeah, it really was. And you know, the Booties and Durans started a, a program there in the very early '90s. And of course, Josh Booty was really the first big time recruit, you know, national player of the year type guy. And then they just had quarterback after quarterback between Phil Dees and Brock Berlin and Brent Rawls and John David Booty. And, you know, all those guys, you know, go in division one like that. But I always tell people we had really good athletes, but we had better coaching than I think anybody, you know, we were very fortunate to have, you know, guys like Ronnie Alexander who had been a coordinator at the uh, FCS level, and we had Pat Tilly and Chris Tilly and, and just all these assistants that have played pro football and been coaches at the college level as well. So as good as we were athletically, I think there was better teams, but we were coaching the, the X's and O's part of what we were doing and, and the five receivers, things that nobody else was really doing at the time in the state. I think that was key to a, a lot of our success. Really was a couple of more minutes with Jacob Hester before we let him get away. Of course, LSU baseball got cut short. I thought it was going to be a a good season, and here's why: because I thought they had the pitching depth, which they have not had in, in most recent years. They had power arms, they had pitching depth, they actually had left-handers on staff. <laughs> I know people question their offense, but ultimately, in college baseball and really at every level, but certainly in college baseball, the pitching and defense is so imperative if you want to win. In particular, with getting to Omaha and the way that stadium plays. So I thought they were set up pretty well. That's why I was really disappointed to see what happened there. I did as well. And, and, and you know, the, the bats, I don't know if they ever would have caught up with the pitching. And you're right, the pitching, one, two, three on the weekend. Then the guy like Jaden Hale, who's kind of an X factor, you really had something set up there with Cole Henry and Landon Marceau. And really the bullpen, you mentioned it, they finally had some lefties back there. When, and last year they kind of hurt them a little bit. But I think college baseball is much more about pitching and defense, like you mentioned, and speed than it is about hitting home runs now. And we've seen a Florida team win it a couple of years ago, and their team batting average was below, um, I think it was like 260 or somewhere around there. And, and that's just a team that found ways to manage runs, right? They, they find ways, and they'd bunt a guy over, whatever it took, and they knew their pitching staff was going to hold whatever lead that they had. And the LSU team – started to figure some of those things out. It looked like there when everything got canceled. And so I know with the baseball draft, who knows what's going to happen. Only five rounds. Does Daniel Cabrera go? I, I expect he will be close. Cole Henry is probably a guy that's going to get selected. You know, how many guys do they lose? I know a guy like Devin Fontenot probably would have gotten drafted somewhere in the 7-8 round, you know, and not having that round, does he decide to come back? Uh, college baseball is going to be fascinating, Ken, to me just because you're going to have all these draftable guys that would have been top 10 round picks back on college baseball rosters because only having a five round major league baseball draft and, you know, Paul Maneri and Nolan Kane, they've got some, some hard decisions to make, but you know, it's better to have a surplus and have those hard decisions than trying to fill out your roster, not knowing where you're going to go. Final thought. I, I have been of the opinion that there will be a college football season and that there will be fans in the stands. And I still maintain that's going to be the case. Now, I don't know that it's going to be what we're accustomed to seeing from a capacity perspective, and I don't know that anybody does. We've seen all kinds of postures out there from people saying what they think is going to happen or what could happen. Ultimately, the sport's too important, the revenue's too important, the budget's too important. We've already seen all kinds of schools cutting other athletic programs. We saw... East Carolina, which is an FCS school, cutting, what, four programs yesterday? And we've seen other schools cut baseball programs. It's terribly disappointing. This is all directly impacted by what's happened already, but also the projection regarding football. I'm sure you think there's going to be a season. If so, what do you think it's going to look like? 
Yeah, I agree with everything you just said. I just think when you look at it, there's just so many things that are tied to college football. And obviously, you know, the TV rights and the ticket sales, that's a big part of it. But think about some of the towns, even at our own conference, in the SEC, in Oxford, in Starkville, in Athens, and all the towns that, you know, make really their yearly budget just off football season. I mean, there's two hotels in Starkville, Mississippi, and yes, they do great in baseball, but it's those football home games where they made their budget. And, you know, the little local dive bar down the street and the little gift shop that's tied to the drugstore, whatever it might be, all those things are so important for those cities to thrive. And I don't know if we're going to have fans in the stands. I don't know if we're going to have 25% capacity. Uh, I do believe as far as on the field action, I think we start on time. I think we get a full slate of games. I don't think we go to conference-only games. The fans is the tricky part, and that's the the part that I think everybody's kind of waiting to drop. But we do have time. We still have time. I know it is coming on us quickly, but we still have time. And one of the things that Commissioner Sankey, you know, was upset about at first was canceling things that were three months, you know, still ahead of you. And take as much time as you can, make the decision as late as you have to. And we've talked about it in this interview already. Getting the guys back on campus was part one, kind of phase one if you will, and now it's figuring out, okay, how do we make sure the players are safe? How do we make sure the staff is safe? And, okay, we got that figured out. What is it going to look like as far as how many people we can allow in these venues? And so that seems to be the biggest part of it. And, man, I'd hate to be the person in charge of that, trying to figure out exactly how that's going to work, how many people we let in. Because, as you know, these big-time schools, they got people who donate a lot of money, and it's a point system. And, you know, you want to make sure that every one of those people is taken care of. And, um, man, I, I can't imagine college football without fans in the stands. But I think if you ask people, they would take it if it, they knew they could still have college football to at least watch on TV. You can follow him on Twitter, at Jacob Hester 18 Of course, you can listen to Hanging with Hester. One four one in Baton Rouge, they do a great job on a daily basis. And, Jacob, listen, I appreciate the time tonight. Keep up the great work. God bless you and your family. Stay safe and enjoy Memorial Day weekend, okay? Absolutely. You as well, Ken. Appreciate it. Okay, Jacob. My pleasure. That's Jacob Hester.